Podcast. Hey, Brad, you know how Nationwide is more than an insurance company? Yeah, they're one of America's largest financial services companies. We get that in a song like business, life, retirement. Or Nationwide's there to protect. I'm kind of the jingle guy. I'm not sure I agree with that. Well, I'm not sure I like your hat. Well, it would never fit on you. Products issued by Nationwide Life Insurance Company or Nationwide Life and Annuity Insurance Company. The general distributor for variable products is Nationwide Investment Services Corporation, member FINRA, Columbus, Ohio. This episode is brought to you by Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. Some things are just better together, like party playlists and Friday nights, campfires and ghost stories, peanut butter and chocolate. And Reese's Cups are the perfect combination of creamy peanut butter and delicious milk chocolate. So, when you want something sweet, you can't do better than Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. Buy Reese's today wherever candy is sold. Welcome to Nature Back Podcast, a talk show where we discuss with our green entrepreneurs and the investors about our green future, hopefully green future. Today, my guest is uh, Tom from Accept Integrated Sustainability. Welcome, Tom. Thank you, Tarmo. Very happy to be here. Tell us what you are doing. Well, that's quite a simple question with a, a bit of a story behind it. Uh, to summarize, I started Accept Integrated Sustainability uh, when I was 19 years old at the end of the 90s, about 25 years ago. And since then, we've been working as consultants that help with strategy design and development for fundamental sustainable projects around the world. And as that has been going on for several decades, we have now learned that our role is actually changing. So we're working on uh, new structures and new uh, organizations where we go from advising and helping others to uh, learn and realize sustainable impact to creating entities that will kickstart true, large, long-term uh, societal transformations in and of its own. So not through client requests. Um, and uh, that is a very exciting transition to go from awareness and then implementing and the support of others to really doing these uh, massive transformation projects that the world really needs because we're... Time is not on our on our side, and we uh, can't just keep playing in the sandbox anymore. We have to, yeah, take serious serious action, and that's what we are transitioning in uh, today. We still mm -hmm. advise organizations, so we're always happy to help. But uh, we are moving on to uh, bigger and more impactful things, such as any any ideas? What could be your future? world-changing projects you in, will be involved with? Yeah, so so we've pinpointed five um, specific intervention points uh, within society that, that, that can use such a snowball effect transition uh, that we are familiar with. Uh, first and foremost, that's the financial sector to help them restructure and, un and understand how long-term investment can benefit themselves towards uh, uh, financial revenue and increased uh, uh, returns, but also have a long-term um, societal impact, which has a risk profile that is much more attractive than just keeping on investing in the old linear economy. Uh, the second one is agriculture and food production, which we've been busy with for a long time. The third one is uh, the built environment, uh, how we build and rebuild our cities. Uh, then there is manufacturing and industry and the supply chain. And last but not least, uh, education and uh, the tools that we need uh, to understand uh, this kind of stuff. And all of that's based on systems thinking, system dynamics and system transformation. And uh, we develop the frameworks and tools to, to actually make that manageable called uh, symbiosis in development, which is also I wrote a book about it. Uh, took me about 10 years, so uh, <laughs> that was a big one. And now going on to my second book um, on the same subject, but just uh, making it easier to understand for uh, for uh, just interested people. 
Um, as an example project, uh, for example, for the city uh, development, is a project called Orchid City. So here we've been investing the last three years, uh, time and effort um, in bringing together all the puzzle pieces that are required to have our living environments be fully, truly fully sustainable, meaning that they take care of all of their own resource needs, talking about energy, water, waste management, but also food production. Um, we're talking about all of our social needs, uh, all of the programmatic aspects that we need in our daily life, from kindergarten to a bicycle repair shops and, and entertainment and a cafe, as well as all the schools that we need, and all of the production and jobs that are associated with it, so that the city can produce its own uh, labor market. Um, so we're not talking about just housing neighborhoods, we're talking really about integrated living environments. And uh, putting all those pieces together, we found that, A, we can do that without any new technologies. Um, so we can build it today, immediately. We don't need to wait until some innovation scales up. B, they are financially really profitable if we do it. So they are investable and uh, they will have long-term return on investments that are very attractive. Third is we do it in a way that they're not just for rich people. They are affordable and they are um, for long term actually more cost effective than the way that we are living today. So they'll actually save on on your year on year costs. And fourth is that they also resolve in the process a great deal of issues we have in our living environment that we weren't necessarily focusing on to fix but they came along in the process. For example, our understanding and our access and exposure to nature, uh, our ability to take care of elderly generations, uh, which is becoming an increasing problem, especially in you know Northwestern Europe, but also in parts of Asia, um, that uh, we are giving elderly generation new purpose and meaning by integrating them into functional society, but also by using uh, cross social services in ways that this resolves itself. Uh, last but not least, this is all built on climate ad adaptive planning strategies so that they can weather the changes that we'll be foreseeing uh, in uh, weather patterns and sea water level rise and so on. So this is one of those projects which uh, it isn't one design. It is a uh, a design toolkit with uh, uh, like quantitative models and all the hard stuff that you really need to make this work. But then given a certain time and place, uh, it helps us to generate these blueprints that actually fit in a certain context, fit the local climate, fit the local culture, the stakeholders that are involved, uh, the people that either already live there or will be living there in the future. So it's really an adaptive uh, process roadmap that helps us to design and plan these uh, neighborhoods. And that's one of them. So uh, once we have two or three of them built, we believe that people will see and the early investors will be very happy to make a lot of money as being the first uh, first movers on this. Uh, while the rest of the world will see, actually, that works a hell of a lot better than what we're doing today. It benefits us pretty much on all sides. So let's swallow that pill. Let's stop doing what we're doing now on our little incremental improvements and switch over to this completely alternate way of planning and building our living environments. And that's an example of one of those snowball uh, projects. And mm -hmm. uh, we've got others for each one of those categories that I named. Mm -hmm. The Orchid City, I mean, partly it's, uh, partly it's, of course, the kind of process development, but uh, where is the first physical Orchid City? Um, we are, so we just finished creating the model, making the prototype designs to test the model. Uh, that's all on paper, of course. Building a city or neighborhood takes decades. So... Uh, at the moment, we are aligning with uh, investors and property developers uh, in Northwestern Europe, in Southeast Asia, predominantly in Vietnam, in the United States and in South America. 
We're also having some partnerships uh, that are looking at opportunities in so, uh, South Sahara, Africa. Mm. So Uganda, Ethiopia. Um, and each one has their own peculiarities. Each one has their own challenges there. Uh, we don't really know where the first one will be. Uh, it's kind of a first mover advantage. So we're making negotiations now with the investors and the developers. So that's still open. Um, we uh, have a lot of hope in Vietnam, which is one of the fastest growing countries in the world. This is why it's so important for us to inject this knowledge into that developmental cycle there. But um, Germany has shown interest. Uh, parties in the United States have shown interest. So yeah, so uh, maybe uh, Estonia might be the first one because they're actually talking about the party uh, in Estonia for a for a small neighborhood. But it doesn't matter how big it is, um, mm. and that might be uh, that might be something interesting. Yeah. Are you aware of the hundred thousand million project? The uh, we had in one of the earlier podcasts uh, a kind of sustainable city project in uh, northern Chile. I don't think so. I might have heard of it, but okay. it doesn't come to mind okay. quickly. It sounded a little bit uh, the similar logic uh, with the Orchid City. So maybe something for you to listen after this after we have recorded this episode of, of the podcast. Um, the uh, you the consultancy yes, what's the what's the kind of biggest uh, maybe biggest learning points from the from the years in the consultancy business? Uh, I mean, what 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 were the big things which drove you to kind of change that direction in a way? Um, wow, well, you know, how do you summarize twenty five years of experience of that? Sorry. I think, huh? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, where do I start? I think there's been, for me internally, in my own mind and understanding of the world, there has been a shift from working with systems analysis and systems thinking to living systems thinking the, the the you know systems thinking is one of those things that people talk about and some people say that they use it and and then there's books about it and so on and it's you know you can you can lead it all the way back to the 50s and 60s as far as these terms go but of course it goes back as far as the humanity started thinking because it's really just a a different mental framework that that is quite intuitive to some um now i feel that i'm living inside of that framework rather than just utilizing it and a big consequence of that is is really the full understanding and acceptance that every party within society is, is kind of fulfilling its role as a cell within the super organism that we are and pointing fingers at like them over there they're being the bad guys and we are the good guys that doesn't help it just doesn't because it doesn't resolve the transition challenges that the parties that we would point the fingers at saying that they're being the bad guys it doesn't solve their conundrum they can't just switch you know it's not that easy and to um to try to find the language and empathic engagement with uh the various entities that are required to make those transitions is an intrinsic part of creating that transition. Otherwise, you're just standing by the sideline and yelling that you want things changed and doing things in the margins, maybe making a little eco village here and there. And then you're very proud of it for taking care of your own stuff. But that's not going to get us anywhere because we're all in the same boat. And that really, you know, is confrontational. You're going to have to engage and constructively collaborate with those entities and people that are at the helm of some of society's large mechanisms that will need to change. Like, what do you want them to do? Uh, stand in, 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 in their shoes, like uh, help to transition their point of view 
given the restraints that they have. And that doesn't mean there's always need to be this full acceptance and and kind of like a a joyful, harmonic understanding of everyone. Certainly there are entities that should know better and that actually do know better and that aren't taking the responsibility the way that uh, that I think that they should be taking it. But there's still a lot of boundaries and a lot of kind of uh, uh, closed doors that maybe, you know, they need help and uh, maybe they don't want the help and maybe... <laughs> You know, uh, they have uh, motivations that aren't altogether altruistic. Okay, well, that's how the world works. And we're not going to solve it by yelling at them. And that's that's a really important one. Because, of course, you know, if you start on sustainability as early as I did, there's a lot of different emotions that come into play. There's the, you know, uh, I just wrote an article on relating those emotions with the five stages of grief. Uh you know, first we have denial. Ah, it's not that bad and technology will save us and, uh, you know, the government will fix it. That's kind of denial. And then you get anger, like, uh, oh, those evil people. And, you know, they should they should <laughs> yep. always pointing fingers. And then you go into bargaining, you know, uh, in like, well, if we just kind of do it a little bit of this, which is basically uh, carbon credit uh that's bargaining. It's mm. trying to fix the world by putting band-aids on everything. That doesn't really work. And then you go to a depression, which is like, oh, nothing works and we might as well give up. And that's the, the one that I find a lot of people in these days, especially younger generations. And who can blame them? You know, mm. uh, you know, being born into this world and first starting your actual cognitive ability to f open up and then you find yourself in a world where on every side you have been blocked from doing anything and the world's problems are being thrown into your lap and how could that not lead to depression with some but then depression is actually a very useful one which can be uh, sobering for us to be able to lean back and then look at the whole and then understand that that's kind of a very strong message to us and a motivator to actually give it a shot because uh, there's nothing else left to do. And then you go towards acceptance. And acceptance is uh, not easy either because then you have to figure out what you're going to do mm -hmm. and how you're going to use your time and your effort to contribute to that transition that we're all facing and um, yeah, so so I think that's a useful framework to think of. And I find myself in any of those stages in various points throughout the week or month. But then it's wise to understand and this systemic understanding, this holistic understanding is that all, all of those stages, they have a function. Um, and for us to just really kind of seek out each other and band together and take the thing seriously. Um, one other really major understanding that I've learned is that something that I really don't like, and you know, they also you have to always communicate about positive things and everything has to be well. I'm not that kind of person. I, I'm either. also yeah, I'm also very critical. So if you mm. show me some kind of project where someone says, "Oh, I've created an agriculture system that creates all food for no energy uh, tomorrow." I'm going to first not believe you because I know enough about agriculture these days that this is a tough nut to crack. There's no silver bullet. Uh, we need many different solutions happening at once in conjunction. And there's not going to be any of that. Uh, as far as I understand today, vertical agriculture isn't going to save us. Aquaculture is not going to save us. But there can be puzzle pieces within the larger recipe of, of how we'll approach things. But And that is false hope is worse than no hope at all. That's currently my stance. Mm. So we are inundated with messages from all kinds of parties in the market or all kinds of organizations that are marketing their solution. And they want to get money and they want to get attention. And you can't blame them for it. But many of them, they create false hope uh, like the example for the agriculture. So 
Here we have the thing, it's going to save us all carbon storage, carbon capture and storage, right? It's going to save all the time. Well, it isn't. It isn't, and it's false hope. And that means that it's distracting us from working on the fundamental solutions. Uh, the things that only help us two, three, four, five years into the future, if they do at all, they are not enough because we that, that's not the the transition timeline we're on. We're a transition timeline of at least 50, if not 100 years to address this. And we're going to walk into a lots of miserable situations as humanity. And we have to be empathic and understanding of that for us to be able to resiliently overcome this together. And if that is not understood, and if you come out and you know get yourself distracted by something like the circular economy is going to solve everything, then you are sticking your head in the sand because the circular economy is not going to solve everything. And if and off by itself, it's not enough, nowhere near enough. So back off with your, you know, with your uh, uh, idea that, you know, if you boundary off something like this and then just, you know, carry the flag on that without actually understanding that we're just in the egg stage of transition. We have so much to learn, so much to continue to develop in all these different sorts of uh, uh, directions. So false hope is something I really, I mean, I immediately shut it down. I don't want to talk about this, uh, about these things that, that, that pretend to be the solution. There is no the solution. There is only a continuous pathway of change. That's the only thing that we have. And in that, there's lots of different things that we can do, and some of them are better than others, but there's no the solution. Hmm. And that's, uh, for me, also a helpful framework to judge on what I invest my time and thinking in versus those things that I don't. What should we do with uh, things like, uh, you know, uh, agriculture's uh, carbon capture pr promises or the carbon credit trading will solve us uh, solve the climate change problem i mean they seem like um, maybe maybe there's something good from the attention point of view in them or is there we were doing some math recently and it showed that the recent hiring spree of esg specialists could uh, fill one third of the nature's financing gap you can crush your fingers and all your toes during a data center migration. You can knock on wood, pluck a dozen four-leaf clovers, or look to your lucky stars for a successful office expansion. You could hold your breath, shut your eyes, and say all the will wishes to help avoid cyber attacks. But none of that truly helps you. Because Next Level Moments need the Next Level Network. With the security, reliability, and expertise to take your business further. AT&T Business. The network more businesses are choosing. Make big career moves and save when you join 100,000 of your peers at the Healthcare Financial Management Association. Access certifications, e-learning, webinars, regulatory resources, compensation data, and a vibrant local chapter network. It's everything you need to boost your healthcare finance career and impress your boss. Get $25 off membership with code SPOTIFY when you join today at hfma.org slash Spotify. There are some of these patterns that I think you are seeing um, that kind of have to kind of tangentially relate to that uh, false hope is worse than no hope. Mm. Um, this hiring spree of ESG is actually quite nefarious. Uh, I see it in our own business. I mean, what, early early 2000s we were the only sustainability consultancy on the market we didn't have to do any promotion or marketing and now we won't we're we're not able to get these uh esg uh, tender programs from governments or something anymore because most of these accountancy firms they've developed their esg packages they've hired bunches of uh, consultants to do it and they focus on doing things like gri reporting and so on in most cases, they don't do anything. The reporting doesn't change anything. It creates some transparency, and that is valuable in and of itself, yes. However, 
using that effort and the money can easily be used to create true roadmaps of change. And that's not what they are doing. So the consultants are, uh, they need to make their own money. It's a very money intensive, highly paid hourly rate kind of thing where most of the time we're like, hang on, organizations can do that part themselves. They just need some guidance in the reporting. Okay, but there's all of these constructs being made and the reporting uh, requirements are being overcomplicated more and more and more because they're created by the same entities that are offering the consultancy services. And so there is a, a mixed interest there, which um, isn't necessarily even done from a nefarious kind of background thing. That's how uh, the market works. You know, it's 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 creating its own demand. And I think that uh, organizations that really want to focus on actually creating an impact and building their long-term resilient strategy, they need to back off from... ESG as being their primary concern, that's something that just comes at the reporting stage and is just the least interesting and least important part. The most important part is actually sitting down and understanding what the organization's relationship is with the rest of the world and figuring out how it can become an active participant in creating the transition towards a sustainable society. So then you have to figure out what is a sustainable society in the context of that organization? Where are the touch points of that organization with society in that sense? And how can it transition itself to benefit itself to create a large user base, a, a customer base and, and, and actions that support the actual transition? And that has very little to do with ESG. Um, so there are these things where the market is blooming and again there's like that false hope uh, situation uh, so you can feel good by hiring an expensive consultancy office to then do your ESG reporting and you've got that box ticked but unfortunately if it only was that easy and it just isn't so that's something I'm starting to see in the media there's far more pushback against ESG uh, it's the whole reason why CSR, which is basically the grandfather of ESG, um, corporate social responsibility, uh, why why that was replaced with the term ESG. And so every 10 years or so, these terms are replaced with another one just to kind of freshen up uh, the whole stuff. But the whole ideas are, are the same and they are uh, usually a... Um, a distraction more than anything else. Was that what you were looking after? Uh, pretty, pretty much, pretty, pretty much. The uh, to me, the uh, this uh, theory we're talking about this five stages of grief comparison to uh, kind of uh, thinking about our nature protection efforts uh, sounded really strong. And I think the uh, the problem I see most is that a lot of people, especially in the startup world and the technology world, live in complete denial. They, uh, you know, I've been in the pa panels uh, on stage where people around me, everybody thinks that technology will solve all the problems. We don't really need to, we just need to innovate on the technology side and, you know, the problems are solved. And I've been the, you know, one lonely voice uh, of the wake up call for everyone to, you know, actually look around and see what the forest around you are doing. Absolutely. That's full on denial. Mm. And it's uh, happening all over the place on even the highest echelons of uh, sustainability thinking. It's also, again, like I said, it's comfortable to escape into denial. It, it, we all want hope, right? Mm. So what if you don't have hope? What if there is nothing and well, then you fall into the depression stage. So, you know, these things, they, they come and rear their heads. Um, we have to accept that we're facing a future where these crises are going to manifest themselves in a wide variety of ways. And in the next 20, 30, 40 years, we're going to have to do uh, crisis management, which is symptom reduction, really. The floods are going to increase. The extreme weather events are going to increase. We're going to have 
major food crises around the world. And in the end, the full acceptance of this will lead you to understand that this will lead to war. War is the ultimate epitome of the system failing. There will be people wanting to move to areas where it is safer than where they are. And the people that are there are going to say, hang on, this is ours. Go away. There's no space here. And that is going to cause friction. And in a world where resources are getting scarcer as they were and population is still growing a bit. Yeah, I mean, that's just the tension on the earthquake happening. And it's you don't exactly know when the earthquake is going to hit, but you know it's coming. And that is what climate adaptation is about. And I think most people easily use climate adaptation as an easy kind of thing to say about, oh, we're doing some measures to prevent climate change. It's not the same thing. It really, really isn't. Uh, So one of the projects that I've been working on for the last 10 years have not really found any financial support or big institutional support yet, but there's one that I want to continue to push is, let's say Orchid City, right? Um, Which is a great blueprint for a living environment, but we are going to have increased migration. We already are noticing increased migration and we're going to continue to see increased migration. Now, how do we prevent migration from becoming friction that leads to conflict? Let's just say that. There is, I think, a constructive way to think about using the tens of thousands of people that are flowing into some countries to create, let's say, orchid city-like Uh, migrant camps where people are put fully into uh, their um, into integrity that they can actually explore their strengths and their skills within a multilingual uh, uh, environment where they aren't just kind of stored in a certain place and fed and kept with a roof over their head but they can become a constructive part of a new society And that isn't going to be easy and it's still going to be tough for the migrants in the first place and also for the organizations and the the communities in which the migrants are moving. But it's a hell of a lot more constructive than building increasingly larger migrant caps in which the conditions are dismal, even in countries like the Netherlands and Sweden and Germany, no matter how hard we try. So why don't we use this as a constructive resource? And how can we then build new channels and flows of 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 our economy and our society in ways that benefit all well let's just first build the orchid cities for for things like this why not they don't have to be expensive they don't have to be you know full of uh, self-driving cars or robots that fly everywhere on the contrary They are not supposed to do that. They're supposed to be accessible, affordable, easy to build and maintain. So uh, there are ways that you can constructively use these things that are considered to be negative, like a migrant flow, and turn them into an asset. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I, I believe that those are useful ways forward, but none of them are going to save us from having to understand, accept, and adapt to coming uh, calamities. Mm. And and that's where the strategy of resilience becomes important. Uh, So this whole discussion between green growth versus degrowth, which I'm sure you've been running into, you know, so green growth saying, no, we can grow, continue to grow the economy while investing in, in green stuff. We can continue to grow. And the degrowth saying, no, that's fundamentally impossible. And we need to find ways to scale some things back while we are reconstructing. I think uh, uh, growth itself is a focus point. Um, I I did uh, parachuting for a while. And one of the lessons that we learned was like, look, if you want to land on the landing spot and you don't want to land in the tree, stop looking at the tree. Don't look at the tree because then you're going to land in the tree. You have to stare at the landing. So you have to stare at where you want to go. 
And I think one of the big problems is we don't have that dot on the horizon. Like when someone asks, what does a sustainable future looks like? Well, I don't know. And then you name some components of what it should have. But really, what? how do we live? How do we uh, work? How do we produce our goods? And there are fractions of that here and there. But this clear dot on the horizon is often kind of missing. And because we can't flow there uh, naturally, I think that that's also one of the important things that we uh, need to do as exercises within our countries and cities and governments and and boardrooms is really paint a proper dot on the horizon doesn't mean that's going to be the answer but at least you have a pathway there Mm -hmm. and that also means stop staring at growth as a thing growth is a parameter that will go up and down as our society continues to roll into into the you know the channels of history but resilience is something you can build. You can build a more resilient society that is able to take hits if it's a famine or a flood or, or disease or whatever. And there are ways in which you become less resilient, brittle, in which, yeah, you're doing okay until you get hit with something and then blah, the whole house of cards collapses. And so a focus on resilience for me is a much more useful dot on the horizon than a focus on either growth or degrowth. Some some areas of society will need more growth. Some areas of society we need more degrowth. It's not a uh, an or or discussion. Mm-hmm. This is a, a system dynamic that, that will take place all over the place, left and right. Resilience, however, is is the ability for the system to withstand unexpected events. And that's something you can build and you just want that. Uh, so that's something you can simply uh, invest in. I don't know if that just makes any sense, but uh... it, it it definitely does. I think the uh, I think on the climate side, uh, you know, governments have been trying to draw the landing plot that this 1.5 degrees uh, warming from the pre pre industrial times, which is a dream in their uh, I don't know. It's basically a dream when you look at the numbers where we are as a as a world. Uh, but but uh, you know the same logic there that you know without the one point five uh, dream or the landing plot, it's uh, it's really difficult to get the governments to move on anything uh, to actually you know get this world you know <laughs> in a, to sustain life on this planet. Yeah, I mean at least it's a dot on the horizon. Yeah. It's a very. This episode is brought to you by Naomi. Naomi is a big, full flavored wine, perfect for those moments when we want to live to the fullest. These are the moments when we are completely satisfied and living in the moment. Naomi uses the best that coastal California has to offer to create our unrivaled Pinot Noir, perfectly suited for the holiday palate. Visit shopmaomi.com. That's shop, M E I O M I.com. Please enjoy responsibly. Naomi Wines of Campo, California. My sister won't be quiet. Screaming the same song I'll drive. And my dad keeps giving me unsolicited love. The spacious new Volkswagen Atlas. It does life beautifully. It's a single faceted one. uh, As if that's the only thing that matters. Mm. Uh, I don't think we're going to hit 1.5. But I find the efforts that we need to do to try to reach it will be in our benefit. Um, but let's not forget that with the 1.5 also come goals in resilience, 
societal harmony, uh, social justice, you know, things like that. Because we don't, we're just going to fight each other. And we're going to have this increasing enrichment of of, of uh, the small financial elite, which is just that ma- that machine is just marching on like crazy. And there's so much pushback against solving that. I mean, there are some arguments. It's not an argument that I've ever made, but there are arguments that say if we solve that one, the financial, uh, the increasing financial inequality, that may be the source, the systemic transition of all. Um, I'm, I don't know if that's the case, but there's certainly strong, compelling arguments for that. And uh, there's even many of those who are in that financial elite that are also advocating for it because they see that, yeah, you know, the guillotines are <laughs> are being lined up. I mean, if this system breaks without us actually managing its downfall, yeah, you're gonna get it's gonna get very ugly. And Maybe. that's yeah, it, it won't just be ugly for them; it will be ugly for everybody, absolutely mm. everybody. Um. Tom, it would be too uh, dark to end on that note. Maybe any any positive notes to wrap up this discussion? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, like I was talking about hope and those five points of grief, right? Um, after working, I mean, let's just keep at Orchid City, but we have uh, a couple of these kinds of systemic solutions. When I showed how Orchid City really worked to a, a German scientist uh, a year or so ago uh, who had been working for 20 years on sustainability, she took a few steps back and she looked at me and she said, this is the very first time that in the history of me studying sustainability that I get a genuine sense of hope. Because this is not a pie in the sky. This is not some kind of fantasy story. This this is work. This is real. We can't and we can't do this. It's realistic. We don't have to wait for a country's government to change all of their policies to do this. We can build this tomorrow if we can get some of the money together, some of the, you know, some landowners and so on. It's it's like there's neighborhoods and cities being built all over the place. And if we can do that that seed and that snowball effect of that being done, that could be a huge transition. And the hope I would like to give you and and the listeners is there's not just one of those, there's many of those transition snowballs and they're not, like many of them are being done by by organizations that are not us, they're around the world. There are organizations using system dynamics and system transition to try to do something that is larger than themselves. You know, that's the essence of it. It's like, don't build a sustainable house that doesn't exist. Build a house that helps to generate sustainability within society. That's a snowball effect. And then keep that rolling. And so that's what makes me hopeful. That's what we around the digital campfire, the real campfire, brings a smile to our face. And that's lovely to work on because this is just this is the this is the real the real hope. That mm. is built on scientifically proven, engineeringly, you know, feasible, ability checked kind of stuff. And that's awesome. That's mm. amazing. So yeah. that's my hope that mm. I hope I can uh, transition to you and, and, and the listeners. Yeah. And next time when we are in the same country, well, let's turn the digital campfire into an analog one. Uh, thanks, Tom, for your time today. My pleasure. Thank you, Tarmo. Miles, are you ready to record our promo for Season 2 of the Wanna Bet Podcast? David, have you ever seen a grown man naked? Miles, we're not here to quote lines from Airplane. We're here to tell people that Season 2 starts August 18th. But I like Airplane. I know you do, but Wanna Bet is a sports betting podcast. Each week we bet $1,000 on the NFL teams and games that we love. Well, that sounds like fun. It is fun. And last year you picked over 60% of your games correctly. How'd you do? We're not talking about that. We are telling people that they can find us every Friday. So no more movie quotes. Roger, Roger. Electric Acid. Welcome to the Reverie Channel, where entertainment knows no bounds. Live concerts, on-demand music, documentaries, and short films, all in stunning HD. Now on Roku TV, Apple TV, and Amazon Fire, immerse yourself from home. And on Android and iOS for those on the move. 
Support creators with crowdfunding donations. Fuel their creativity. Join us in shaping entertainment's future. The Reverie Channel, where every view, every donation matters. Electric acid.